3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we will begin the fireside this evening. Friends, uh, a warm welcome to all of you who are joining us this evening on this wonderful fireside with the subject of Humanity Restored, Testing for a Remedy. My name is Hedye Afsharian. Uh, I'm from Richmond Hill, Canada. Um, for those of you who are a little further from, from here where I'm sitting, Richmond Hill is a, is a suburb of the city of Toronto, uh, Ontario, Canada. Um, friends, this evening was organized with the help of uh, a group of friends and some volunteers uh, on the foot of an individual initiative to create, if you would have it, a fireside hub um, where a hundreds of Baha'is from across the globe can access um, these firesides on a specific website. And these firesides are of course recorded in different languages. Tonight's fireside uh, is presented in English and it will also be recorded and will be available at the website. The website is www.baha'ifireside.org. Um, so because there's a little bit of disturbance uh, in, in hearing my comments, I will try to keep it very brief and pass it on to Mr. Fatazam as, as quickly as possible. And I apologize for that. Uh, tonight's topic, Humanity Restored, Testing for a Remedy. So if we consider the topic for just a minute, um, what do we mean by humanity restored? Is it to reestablish a former condition that perhaps we were comfortable with? Or is it to bring us back to an everlasting state of humanity? If I can demonstrate perhaps by using an example, the remedy used to restore health can be quite effective if illness is detected early. And of course, the diagnosis, the cure, the treatment for the illness can be more difficult the more delays we have and the more advancements that the sickness is taking. And if you consider this current example, this pandemic that has very clearly shown us this pathological truth and the similarity of the steps needed to rectify this disease, to rectify this virus, and the relevant analogies between those steps and the processes with this, the steps that we need towards similar crises that we have around the world. Friends, I want to tell you a little bit about our speaker this evening, uh, Mr. Fatazam. Um, just going to give you a short bio um, about his accomplishments and a little bit about his resume. Can you still hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Okay, wonderful. Mr. Shahbaz Fatazam holds an honors degree from University of London and the London School of Economics and Political Science. He has worked in the field of health and diagnostics medicine for the last three decades. He has been a guest lecturer at several universities in Brazil. He is currently the country's manager for a major US laboratory information systems developer. He has also published a book in 2015 entitled The Last Refuge. 50, the Last Refuge, 50 Years of the Universal House of Justice. Shabbos is born, was born in India. He was raised in Israel. He studied in England and Canada, and he presently lives in Moreno, Brazil. And he is conduct, he's co connecting with us from Brazil this evening, and we can't wait to hear from you. 
So I'll pass the fireside over to Mr. Fatazam. Can't wait to hear from you. Thank you, Hedy. Am I clear? Am I clear? Yes. Well, it's good to have so many unmasked faces before me. You know, it's, uh, I always found it very incongruent that we put our masks on to show solidarity and make everyone healthy, but we're in fact creating more antagonism because of the mask, you know? The face is a very interesting thing. What do we do when we see someone? The two things we do simultaneously when we see a face, we identify the person and we see his emotions. The mask brutally destroys this. So it's good to see your faces. And I'm very happy to be here. Humanity restored. The word restored is a very lovely English word. It suggests wholesomeness. And as Hedy said, we can either restore to a previous condition or we can restore to a new condition and so on. Testing for a remedy, the word test is also important because you have to have the capacity to know what you're doing with the remedy. You don't give the remedy in the wrong hand. So when you're testing a remedy, the lab must be in top tip, tip top shape, must have its technological capacity, its manpower, people should be trained, so that's the idea of the test. And remedy is the all important component. Give it in the right dosage. Detect it early, apply it correctly and so forth. Um, I hope we can have some analogy to our present situation, which is the coronavirus. Um, before we go on to the slide of the pandemic, as she said, restoring to what condition? I really only see three possibilities. We can restore ourselves to business as usual, which is the conservative approach. In other words, national sovereignty, market mechanisms are adequate to take us out and we go back to business as usual. This is the conservative approach. We have the reformist approach, which is still staying with our original systems, but with some modification, innovation, We'll talk about these later. And the third approach, which is a total global transformation. So this is what we'll be looking at, you see. We can stay as we are, go back to what we are, go back to what we are with some constant modifications, give more money to WHO, for example, you know, create new agencies, but essentially the systems are the same, national sovereignty, market mechanisms, but some welfare state and so on. Or we go to a total new value system, total global transformation, which is what I believe in. We do have some people who have similar ideas, world federalists, planet citizens, and so on. But 
the concept of global systems, global transformation is relatively new. I mean, you don't speak about global systems in the middle ages, you don't speak of it 200 years ago. The concept of a world government, the concept of global uh, interconnectivity really came at the end of the last century, or two centuries ago. For example, the World Parliament of Religions was a year after Baha'u'llah died in 1893. You see that people, there's a consciousness for global transformation. League of Nations, 1919, a year after World War I, is a recent thing. So the third approach that we will look at is also relatively new in the consciousness of humanity um, and so forth and so on. Let's go to the slide, please. Yes, this, we've seen this, the title slide. we we'll go to the other slide. No, there's one before, yes. It's a beautiful painting. Uh, yeah. Good. And it's uh, 16th century. Pieter Brugel, a Dutch painter who later died in Belgium, but it's a Dutch Flemish painter, where he depicts the plague. Um, you know, the plague has been with humanity ever since recorded history. Um, And this creates issues, but we have it in the Bible. We have it in 6th, 5th, 6th and 7th century Justinian plagues. And of course, we had the big Black Death plague, which is rodent disease. These were all rodent flea bites and so on. Um, the Black Death was devastating. Half of Europe died. And this is the painting, you see. And that plague was the Black Death. I was always curious why Black Death. But I think they, there was a misinterpretation of the Latin word atro, meaning black or terrible. And hence the word Black Death. But the, the body doesn't become black or doesn't suffer color changes. Anyway, so. You see, the plague keeps coming, and by the end, by the part, by the part, initial part of 20th century, we don't have the plague anymore. We have modern diseases now, polio and so forth, typhus, but they keep coming. Um, and the coronavirus has really showed how fragile we are. You know, we woke up in 2002 with SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome. That was the big shock. I remember it, 2002. But it was not virulent and humanity was lazy. We didn't uh, take it seriously and so forth. So we woke up with SARS. And then we had Ebola. So you see, these things keep coming up. And then we had MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. Why haven't we got our act together? And the coronavirus just shot up all our systems as very defective and weak. And we always looked at Western democracies and Europe for its fantastic healthcare. 
and they didn't know what to do. Italy began to receive the first brunt of it near Venice. And Venice has a history poor thing of plagues and so on. But we didn't know what to do. It swept, swept to the biggest economies. And people are saying, well, if the fancy democracies of the West aren't doing a good job, how can you expect others to do any better? Or worse, we're not confident that these systems are good, you see. A system is only good as it is stabilizes unforeseen events. And all these fantastic Sweden health system are not coping. So the people who are outside the democracies who have a different system and different developments do not trust that we are all that what we are supposed to be. So it has a whole range of geopolitical issues and you know, it's very important, but it has woken up the world. This is what I'm trying to say. And public health measures only go so far in resolving coronavirus. What are the public health measures? Social distancing, isolation, masks, washing the hands. But this won't solve the problem. We need an inner body um, improvement also. So this is why the analogy I find interesting with coronavirus, that public sanitation only goes so far. We need an inner um, view of things also, which is boosting our immunity and um, suppressing our inflammation, not to sound too technical, but whenever we inflame our tissues, the virus likes that and it injects us with its venom. So if we have to, we have to suppress inflammation and boost immunity, you see, with vitamin C, with vitamin B, and a whole host of internal things. So we have an outside and an inside approach. So this is, uh, this is the interesting part and a good analogy for global systems and so on, um, which I find the coronavirus has woken us up to. Um, yes, we could go on with that. Um, but let's now move to the other slide. So the situation of the pandemic has showed our fragility as a scientist, as fragility as a democratic political system, our hypocrisy because we keep saying science is our savior and tries to bring nature into control, but we're ignoring nature and we're uh, not following what science is telling us. So it's a hypocrisy issue also, which is very sad. Um, and I remember, and I recall this text of Baha'u'llah, which is a very beautiful text. Whenever you see a frame like that, it's a holy scripture, you know what I'm saying? The whole human race is languishing on its bed of sickness, sore tried and disillusioned. They have interposed themselves between it and the divine and infallible physician. They can neither discover the cause of the disease, nor have they any knowledge of the remedy. It's a pertinent text, and the whole human race is what I find fascinating. This was written 200, just under 200 years ago. But the whole human race, I find interesting because it reminded me of the Falklands. You know, Falkland Islands is a distant, God-forsaken place. Two islands in the South Atlantic 
And whoever dreamed, for the people residing there, whoever dreamed that one day their sheep farms would be the battleground of a major war. Not in their faintest dreams when they took their wives and children to Falkland Islands to escape the world, could they ever imagine in the South Atlantic, 8,000 miles from Europe, it could be a battleground of powers. So there is no escape, friends. The whole human race is languishing on its bed of sickness. Um, let's go to the next slide. And continuing on this, the all-knowing physician had his finger on the pulse of mankind. He perceived the disease and prescribed it in his unerring wisdom, the remedy. So people are looking to a North Star. If we don't have a North Star, we're not, we don't know where we're going. When this, when we talk about the all-knowing physician, it's referring to a whole change of values, a whole change of approach, which we'll see later on. But basically what we're trying to say is that the interconnectivity of everything in the world forces us to make cooperation, collaboration, substitute competition. We can't go on like we're doing as competing systems. We can't continue as a mistrust, and we can't continue with a lack of leadership. So the third approach we mentioned early on of global transformation requires a global vision and some guidance. So that um, this powerful phrase, this powerful sentences of all-knowing physician have his finger on the pulse is precisely a kind of remedy to force us to review our hypocrisies, our systems, and so on. I like the word physician, it's not doctor. Physician is, is, comes from the French physicien, which is the healer, which is someone who promotes health, you know, in the original term, and not the interventionist, intersectionist, type of medicine we see today. Um, so to look at this remedy that the physician is talking about, we have the outward and the inward. The coronavirus has taught us that we need an outward solution, public health, and an inward solution. Inoculize, inoculate ourselves with some vaccine to boost our inner strength. And this analogy of outer and inner is fascinating because this is how we change the world. We have an outer system. We must have rules of law at place. We must have institutions. We must have uh, systems at work, but also internal change. We cannot have outer stability without inner stability, friend. You see, I cannot have outer peace unless I have inner peace. So that's the idea. Um, you know, it's, it's, it sounds pretty desperate, but when we have only discovered 1% of over a million zoonotic-based viruses, we have quite a future that is troublesome. 1% we have discovered of this virus, H1N1, SARS, and so on, and not even COVID. 
So this is a bit worrisome because there'll be others in the future. So the point I'm trying to make is that the coronavirus, aggressive and horrible as it is, doesn't concern me. It's the future that concerns me. We have an existential crisis looming on the horizon, which is climate change. And if governments can't agree on the virus and how to deal with the virus and exchange information, how are we going to deal with the climate crisis? It's very, very worrisome. Um, so that uh, this is the, the thing, the future concerns me because the coronavirus will find the vaccine. And like I said, the plague has always plagued humanity. There'll be others coming up. Don't forget that we've lost 34 million souls in the last four decades from HIV, AIDS. So this is the, the thing that concerns me is that people say, well, we'll live with this also. It's like a lazy, I'm not responsible type attitude. Well, we live with AIDS. I mean, we we'll live with dengue. 400,000 people a year suffer from dengue, which is a mosquito. And we don't have solution. So we can't go into this um, morass of just switching our eyes and not reflecting. You know, Hannah Arendt, a famous uh, philosopher, I like her a lot, the writings of Hannah Arendt, a Jewess. She was the first tenured woman professor of Princeton. And she wrote The Origins of Totalitarianism. And in it, she wrote on the banality of evil, that everything becomes banal, used to it. HIV, wars, it's always part of humanity. She says, there's a strange interdependence between non-reflection and evil. Saying it just gives me goose pimples. She says, there's a strange interdependence between non-reflection and evil. People don't think, don't want to think. They don't want to see. They put their blinders and say, this is always the happen, this will always. So this is very worrisome. And we're feeling that this could go on with the virus. <clears throat> so that uh, the more we are shaken, the more we are numbed into inaction. You know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very, uh, and it's getting worse. I mean, you become numbed into inaction. Humans are always violent, therefore there will be wars. Shahbaz, you know, my doctor friends say, look, we'll get over the virus. And I say to myself, they're putting on their blinders. And... I remember the sentence of Hannah Arendt, a remarkable woman. She was always worried about how totalitarians come up. How can there be so much evil? And she said, there's a very strange interdependence between non-reflection. In other words, people don't want to see, reflect, wonder, understand why these things happen. Next slide. This is not an optometry test to test your eye vision for your driver's license. Uh, it looks like it, but it's not. There is a two Greek letters. The left Theta, the right, P, or pi in English. Th, left, refers to theoria in Greek, theory. 
and the right pi, thank you, is P, refers to praxis, Greek words, theoria, praxis. This is our predicament. Theory and practice should be together. And they're not together. So we talk about cooperation, we don't cooperate in practice. I like this slide because you'll always remember it. Theory says something, but in practice, things have worked out the other way around. What went wrong? The best classic example of this is Plato, no? Plato the philosopher, political philosopher. And he wrote fantastic treatises, his dialogues on pol political philosophy, republic, statesmen, laws, you studied these. And in it, he says, the philosopher king will resolve the problems and so on. And he was so confident that he left his armchair and went to the south of Italy to put this in practice and help the local governors to resolve the political instability in Syracuse and Sicily. He failed. And not, the, not only he failed, he failed, he failed miserably. And he quickly went back to his academia. So it's a classic example that if king's leaders have a good philosophy, they will become good leaders, create stability, and therefore my theory is working. He tried to apply the theory in practice and he ran back to his office with very, very meager results. So this is a classic example. Um, how do we approach, bring together theory and practice? Baha'is have a theory. How does it work in practice? Will it work in practice? The United Nations in theory is to create stability, a world order model but in practice it's not. So it's, it's a dilemma. Remember these two letters, theta and B, theory and practice. Whatever you do, you should approximate the two. Next slide. How do we approximate theory and practice? Well, I went deep, deep, deep thinking into this and came up with this other treasured quotation from our founder of our faith. Within the treasury of trust, have I called, and resignation, tafbiz, we have bequeathed an excellent and priceless heritage. Beautiful. This is from his will and testament. A year before Baha'u'llah died, he wrote this Will and Testament, and this is the first sentence. So how does this apply to approximating theory and practice? Really in the deepest level, I see it as this is the key. Trust and resignation. Trust in an authority higher than ourselves, and resignation to circumstances beyond our control. Humanity is not doing this. It's beautiful. Remember, if you don't forget, remember anything what I said tonight, remember this, trust and resignation, the key to bringing theory and practice together. This has to be dealt with. I don't know how much time we have because time is running out. Um, oh, um, very quickly, you see, it's an attitude of prayer that is missing in humanity. It's the, if you like, least resistance. It's 
but it's really an attitude of prayer. Trust authority. We're not trusting any authority. Resign, submit to things you don't understand. We revolt. We resent. We will go nowhere without trust and resignation. This is a deep subject. I love it a lot. But trust in an authority higher than yourself. The best analogy is the doctor again. I trust him. I enter, I renounce myself, resign to his prescription. You see, because it's an authority higher than me. I obey my father, even though I don't understand why, because he's an authority higher than me. I can bow over. We don't have that. We question, we have no trust, no social capital, let alone spiritual capital. Um, so it's a very profound thing. And we can talk at length in questions and answers. But you see, um, trust and resignation go hand in hand. They're not separate, they're twin. If I trust someone very strongly, it's easy to resign. It's easy to submit. If I don't trust, I will always resent, battle, question, why, how, why, how. I walk out of the doctor's office, mm, this prescription doesn't smell right. It's stupid. And resignation without trust doesn't exist. Of course, we don't resign if we're agents of our own suffering. That doesn't make sense. I'm not resigned that one day I'll have liver disease because I love my wife. You see, that's not resigning. That's not resignation. I'm resigned to the fact that I'll have a tummy ache because I love pistachio flavored ice cream. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't make sense. So, when we're agents of our own suffering, we don't resign. We, we resign to things outside our control. And we have to have this attitude of prayer. It's a nice way of putting it. And so um, we'll talk about it later because the time is now almost running. Let's go to the next one. Really? I have a charming assistant here who is helping me. So this attitude is important, but behavior also is important. Attitude being, I'll stop drinking. Behavior is that I'll try my best to do that. Every Monday, I'll stop drinking a bottle and so on. So attitude and behavior, as psychologists would say, are different things. So the attitude of trust and resignation is fundamental. It's a beautiful concept, very deep. But also we need to act. And here is a text from Abdul Baha, the son of Baha'u'llah, which reads as follows. Endeavor, ceaseless endeavor is required. Nothing short of an indomitable determination can possibly achieve. And Abdu'l Baha wrote this in Secret of Divine Civilization. Hard work. You see? Tireless hard work is important. Um, beautiful uh, statement so that it's, it's faith in action. It's no longer trust resignation, but Faith that you, have, you can do this and things should be done based on your trust and resignation. Your attitude was good. Now your behavior should be, oh, hard work. So a ceaseless uh, endeavor is required. Abdul Baha says that um, in many places. Hard, hard work. Um, try, try, never give up. Okay, next slide.
So these are not days of prosperity. I think humanity is so lazy that, um, and lethargic that we want prosperity every time. And this never will have that. These are not days of prosperity and triumph. The whole of mankind is in the grip of manifold ills. Strive, therefore, to save its life through the wholesome medicine which the almighty hand of the unerring physician again hath prepared. So, again, this idea of prosperity is something which is elusive because all world order models say that we need four things for a world order to function. Economic prosperity, political peace, social justice, and environmental stability. This is the goals of the world order that people talk about. This is the model people talk about. And Baha'u'llah says you'll never have prosperity unless you follow the divine physician. Very profound. Um, yeah, move to the next slide, please. Yes. Now, what is the, our goal of world order? The world order model, it's a project. I mean, it's everywhere. You discuss it at UNDP, you discuss it at United Nations, you discuss it at commissions of parliament, economic prosperity, how do we do it? Political peace, how do we establish peace? Social justice, how do we create welfare? and environment, how do we protect the environment? If we have this, beautiful. That's our goal of the world order. But look what the Baha'is say. Very interesting. What is our goal? This is the House of Justice in this peace message of 1986, beautiful. We we join with all whose devotion to principles of peace and world order promotes the ennobling purposes for which humanity was called into being by an all loving creator. Beautiful. Nothing there of prosperity, nothing of economic stability, peace. In other words, the ennobling purpose of humanity is not economics, politics, social. It's to know, love God, trust in his manifestation, and obey. Recognize the manifestation of God and obey. You know, the word obedience is an interesting word. How many minutes, Hedy? No, no, how many minutes? Five. Um, obedience is a composite Five term. Five minutes, thank you. Obedience is something that someone says trust and resignation is a form of obedience. Mm. I'll tell you, obedience is two words in Latin, op to and audire. Audire is listen, to listen. It's not blindly following, you see. So obedience is like a form of understanding and not yes, sir, no, sir. Um, you know, it's a beautiful thing, but in Hebrew, the word obedience doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Obey. In the Hebrew language. The closest they have is Shema. Shema in Hebrew means listen. 
The, Brit, the greatest prayer they have in Hebrew is Shema Israel. Listen, O Israel. They have equated obedience with listening. You cannot do something, you cannot obey if you don't understand or listen what the God, God is saying. It's a very profound concept, Shema. And the biblical people and the King James Version, when they translated into English, because the Bible was originally in Greek and then they made it into Latin. And this obedire, obedire, obedire is the Latin for obedience, is really to listen. So they translated as hearken which is nice, which is the same in English to listen. Hearken is in the Bible for obey. But then as the years went by and people became modern, they put obey because it's easier to understand. But obey is not what God wants. He wants us to understand his laws. Um, And, and never are God's laws arbitrary or irrational because of this. Precisely because he wants us to understand. The principle of consciousness is understanding, not obeying. You see, it's very beautiful. So that God, when he says, for example, to Adam and Eve, don't take that fruit. He doesn't stop it. In other words, he says, don't take that fruit because you will suffer, you will. It's this understanding that God wants us to understand. It's this listening to the commandments and not necessarily obeying it blindly. So, um, understanding is the key to um, obeying these visions and goals and world order. Unless we understand, we will be in the bondage of men who groan and pretend to obey. One last slide. We need a North Star. I talked about it early. This is the North Star in the Northern Hemisphere. The world, the Earth, the axis of the Earth points to the North Star. Unless we, we don't, if we don't have a North Star, we don't uh, find our way. It's a symbol of hope and inspiration also. But it's a physical star. We have lost our North Star. We have no hope. No uh, uh, chosen highway. It's very, very sad. You know? And as Baha'is, our North Star is there, you see. Our North Star is the Holy Land, the writings, <clears throat> recognition of our central figures, adherence to their laws, unreserved acceptance of their writings. Oh, we could talk all night. I enjoyed myself. Thank you so much. Unmasked faces. Thank you, dear Shabbos, uh, for a, an amazing 55 minutes of uh, incredible insight that you provided uh, for our group this evening. Um, so many thoughts, so many <laughs> nuggets for us to go away with. Uh, you talked about the all physician, the all knowing physician who has his finger on the pulse. And then how does that spark us in reviewing our hypocrisy? So profound. And um, the one slide that you asked us to remember, if that's going to be the only thing that we're going to remember from this presentation, 
the concept of theories and practices. So the Baha'i theories that we have, and then how do we put them you know, in practice? And, and then the relationship of that to trust and resignation. But not just that, not just trust and resignation on its own, but also the endeavor, the ceaseless endeavor, as Abdul Baha explains. Um, how do we uh, in endeavor? How do we ceaselessly endeavor every day to achieve that North Star that may have been lost to the entire world, the entire globe? Um, <coughs> You Thank you. Um, can you hear me well, everyone? Am I being heard? Okay. Um, we have uh, a few minutes uh, for some questions and some more insights. Uh, and Shahbaz, dear Shahbaz is here to answer. Um, I'm going to um, take a look at uh, the, the question that I have here. Um, so the question says, and the question is from Samim uh, Monazavion. And Samim asks, could you please explain if it is possible to find harmony between obedience and the investigation of, of truth? So again, obedience uh, versus understanding uh, and, and the relationship of that to the investigation of truth. Beautiful question. I don't know, I don't know the author of the question, but hello. Um, hello. When Baha'u'llah was in Baghdad, Baghdad in 1863, a journalist came to see him. And he said, this theory of yours, uniting the world, humanity as one, how do you hope to achieve it? And Baha'u'llah responded with this, through the independent investigation of truth. So that if truth is one, humanity will automatically come together. That's a very good question. So the key to unity is not forceful compliance, not uniformity, not mediation that our governments are doing, not um, imposition, not coercion from an outside you know, threat, but through investigating the truth coming back to Hannah Arendt's comment of reflection, how important it is. So if we don't investigate the truth, we will never unite. Non-reflection is our dilemma. Now, our soul must obey this necessity, this truth, not my mind. You know, uh, Francis Fukuyama is an interesting person. He's a very strong political theorist. And his recent book, I, I recommend you read, came out two years ago. His books are usually not colossal of work, but this book is called Identity, The identity, the demand for dignity, and the politics of resentment. I'll see what, I'll tell you what he's saying. So, in this book, he has a sentence on page 11, which I found, I found remarkable. He said in the book, and I quote, we need a better theory of the human soul. someone who is talking about institutions and trust and, and social capital and political theory came up with a sentence that 
made me think and, and left it smart on page 11. We need a quote, we need a better theory of the human soul, human soul. Because if we don't investigate the truth, we create resentment, which is his thesis. We create, what, is the, what, is the, what does man want? Just prosperity, just peace, just social justice. There's resentment. People are not finding a meaning in life. So he says, we need a better theory of the human soul. I found that amazing. That here we have someone who is, you know, dealing with systems and yet he comes up with something like this because he says the soul is on fire. The soul is unhappy. The soul has to obey its, its, um, its mission. And the problem with the soul it has to face is the self. The biggest barrier of the poor soul is self, nafs. Abdu'l-Bahar refers to our insistent self, horrible. And self was created for one thing and one thing only, to abdicate itself. I think that's why we have God created self, so we get rid of it. It's like a test. So the soul has to obey this questioner was perfect. His need and um, to discover the truth and not allow the insistent self, nafsa amare, which commands our life, which is appetitoso in Portuguese, which is appetite, you know, which is greedy and so on, is hurting our soul and. Uh, Fukuyama, he's a great thinker and intellectual, talks about this. So I hope I answered the question, Hedy. And the gentleman or the lady, not see me. Huh? Her name. Uh, the question came from Samim Monzavion. Okay. Thank you. Um, friends, please uh, remember that you can use uh, the chat box to uh, post your questions. Uh, and I'd be more than happy to convey them or ask you uh, to just uh, ask your question live, if you like. Um, we do have one more question here uh, in the chat group. The question is from uh, Shadi Lagoi. Uh, Shadi asks, um, can you share an example or two um, of what in the current state of affair of the world you have found uh, would progress or be remedied with this concept of trust and resignation that you spoke about? Well, um, it's a, in the outside of the Baha'i world, it's a tricky one because um, you find it in specific settings in healthcare. You find it in specific settings of schools, education, where people trust their teachers. Well, you, they will they resign to the fact that they have to follow protocol, school hours, homework. So these are specific settings of trust and resignation, but we don't have it in our leaders. And that's very sad because the function of a leader is to keep us safe and have not feeling safe. The concept of a corporate leader is to have his staff feel safe. They don't feel safe. The concept of a general leading his army is to keep his soldiers safe and they're they don't feel safe. This is the key. So unfortunately on a broader leadership level, political leaders and so on, trust and resignation, I can't see, um, definitely not. We have it in history through our saints, in the Christian saints, we have it in the Islamic people, we have it in religious 
um, outlook to life. Definitely, um, we have it uh, in these areas, you see. Um, but sadly, every day it's, it's becoming lesser and lesser. Um, but in specific settings, we have it, but on a broad level, we don't. Thank you, Shahbaz. Uh, again, friends, if, if you have comments or questions, please feel free to even type your name in the chat box and I'll be more than happy to, to call out on you or, or read, uh, read your question for you. Um, I have a, a, a comment or a question here from uh, Hamed. Uh, Hamed, I can see you. Um, I'm going to, uh, or how about you unmute yourself and then maybe you can ask your question live. So we hear someone else's voice as well. All right, thank you. There we go, well, thank you, Hamid. Thanks. Nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see everybody. Shabbat uh, thank you very much for the very nice presentation. So this trust and resignation, you know, I guess, I don't know how to say it properly, but I guess, you know, if you're a believer, so. So it's very good. But let's say that, you know, how do we make sure that this trust and resignation does not end up in inaction? Say that, you know, okay, I trust and I resign. So what does it matter that if I do something or if I don't do something? So if you can elaborate on that, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, trust and resignation don't leave to action, no. They are a state of mind, definitely, and a predisposition. What moves us to action is faith, more specifically. So faith leads to action. Um, faith leads to action. Faith is action-oriented. Um, you know, we're not born with faith. We're not born with faith. Faith is born when we recognize the manifestation of God for this day. That's when faith is born. So it's a conscious thing and it has to lead to action. Otherwise it's, it's, it's just trust and resignation. So your vehicle, transform, transformative vehicle is faith to answer you. So faith, if you have faith, it leads to action. With time, your faith will lead to certainty, which is a step higher. So you leap into the absurd world to do your things, trust and resignation, and then you see results happening. You become firm. You become certain. So that's the next level. Iran. Iman becomes Iran. And then when you reach this level of certainty, you're open to more and more sacrifice, more and more action. And this is very interesting. You don't do sacrifice unless you're certain of the results. And, uh, and sacrifice is, is finally the, what God wants on the highest level, yeah. I hope I answered your question. Very good question. I'm enjoying the questions here. Yeah, I don't have to enjoy the answer. I have a question here uh, from Luca, Luca Monajem. Uh, Luca, why don't I invite you to unmute yourself and ask the question live? How does that sound? That sounds good. There we go. Thank you, Luca. Go ahead. I uh, just wanted to say, I thought it was really interesting. Thank you for your time. Uh, my question, uh, 
if there was more trust in general constructive communication. Got cut off. Oh, sorry. Uh, my question was, if there was more trust and general constructive communication between political leaders, do you believe that the effects of the coronavirus could have been mitigated earlier? Well, we read things in the media, and unfortunately, I don't trust the media. So I don't know if the media is correct when it says that the Chinese, this section didn't inform the other section. Um, so we have to be a bit wary of this because I really the media is a disaster, any level, be it Canada, be it Brazil, be it Russia, they're not helping. So we don't know what the facts are. But if there's trust on the highest level, um, of course things would happen. You know, medical research is perhaps the only research which is heavily dependent on exchange of information. A scientist in China must have some database from scientists in America to create the data bank, you see. It doesn't work otherwise, especially medical research, which I'm in, not directly, but indirectly. Imagine medical research with no trust. How can you exchange, how can you have a vaccine if you don't trust the information you're getting, or the other one doesn't even want to share because they're gonna get the profit. It's a very sad state, but coronavirus is suffering because of this lack of exchange, precisely in an area which is sensitive to exchange, medical research. So, yeah, it's, 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 it's definitely uh, Thank you, Luca, for the question. Um, Shahbaz, do you mind just um, elaborating a little bit more on this uh, subject that you spoke about of acceptances that, that we just tend to live with? Um, it, it really hit home for me as I was listening to your presentation. Um, there are certain circumstances, there are certain uh, conditions that uh, either as individuals, as communities, or as a global family, we, we tend to just accept and live with it. How do we change that or attempt or aspire to gradually change that, evolutionize that change of not accepting, and, um, but at the same time, trust and resignation in the formula but then wanting to change what needs to be changed and not be accepted. Excellent. Thank you. You know, we have a poet, W.H. Auden. I like him. He's, uh, he's my favorite 20th century poet. In one of his poets, he writes, peace and lethargy are policing the world. When you have peace and lethargy, lethargy is exactly that, accepting things as they are, lazy, and torpor. Huh? Um, this is not good, which is um, wallowing in laziness and so on. So you don't, ex you accept things as they are, you're happy, you are what you call lethargy. Um, Two things shake you up. One is a convulsion, and the other is search for truth, the breeze of God touching our in, inner being, you know? Unfortunately, there's no other way um, to waken us and come out of our lethargy. You know, convulsion is exactly that. It creates a rupture. We're stuck between two parallel lines, the illness of coronavirus and the rupture it has created. The social rupture, the devastation, unemployment went up 10%, it's now 20% in America. 
people have lost their jobs. So this is rupture and the other is illness. So we're caught in a shallow, sandy, no man's land, which is horrible. We don't know whether to attack the illness or solve the social issues. It's a very, very serious thing. And maybe this will waken us from not accepting things as they are. Um, so shaking is, is definitely important. Um, and the other is resentment. You don't need a convulsion when you have two things happening in the world, which is making people like Fukuyama, Fukuyama say people are becoming resentful. Resentful comes with revolution. You know, the French Revolution started of two things. Of course, we're talking about 1789, but the anarchy, people resenting, and a corrupt authority. This is happening now. They're seeing corruption. Blatantly, leaders don't even care that they're suffering have corruption in the government and people are resentful. So this is another healthy, ironically speaking, healthy sign. When you have high inequality and high cor corruption like Brazil, it makes people resentful and they can come to change and work and work and wake up from their acceptance. In Brazil, you see, we have two issues which is halting our growth for many years, corruption and social inequalities. So these two, if we solve these two things, we can go forward, but people are resentful. In America, the top 1%, I don't know, four year, 40 years ago had 5% of the wealth. Now the top 1% have 29% of the wealth. People just don't accept. So there's resentment and convulsions. The two can create quite a fire. Um, and the virus um, showed us that taking out the veneer of things are all good, business as usual, prosperity, things are not. And the virus has shown us that. And you see this in the movements happening in cities, the violence. It's all part of the convulsion and resentment. Yeah. Thank you, Shahbaz. Uh, speaking of uh, convulsion and changes, I'm sure um, your experiences in, in being in a lockdown uh, in Brazil, perhaps a little bit different than some of the other friends who are on the Zoom this evening in Canada. Um, tell us a little bit about what you do during lockdown in Brazil. Just share with us. Well, I do what I like most, write to myself. That's inspirational. Yeah, I write uh, articles in Portuguese on the virus and the implications it has on philosophy, on mental attitudes. I produce six and a thousand people read it. So it's fun. It's a page long and I can share it with people who want to hear it. But I write, I read, um, I deal with my remote clients remotely. I'm a salesman. So if you can't travel, it's, it's, it's a major disruption. So the rupture is hitting me in the pocket. Um, since early March, I haven't traveled. Um, so the clients know that we talk, we do WebEx, we do Zoom. In terms of professional, you know, how do I do professionally to help others is to connect regularly give them confidence that our company can do things remotely, that we're not letting them go on the automation of labs, that we are at their disposal 24 hours and so on. They feel that they're sincere and they, they feel our sincere, 
we're sincere. But I'm raring to go. And here we're now mid-June. Um, prospects are maybe July. But uh, I'm in a high risk group, Hedy. So I'm a walking time bomb. I can't uh, take my lockdown too lightly. Yeah. Yeah, certainly some challenges are very similar across the globe, and some are different and unique to every different individual. But I think what is common is how we use this time. Uh, and you mentioned you use this time to write essays and, and, and articles and how we use this time effectively and efficiently, I, I suppose, is very, very important. And I'm sure we've all uh, here on this call have done that in one way, shape or form. We have uh, a, a, just a, a little bit uh, more than five minutes, maybe perhaps six minutes left. And there's one more question here. I would like to be able to share this and then maybe we'll just close off. Um, the question is from uh, Mr. Sohrave Yazdani. He asks, uh, and we did talk about this briefly, but um, he asks, the master in, in several tablets talks about the station of resignation. Uh, how can we achieve or intent to such station? You know, renounce our belongings. We renounce ourselves because we get it back. So resignation is the key to prosperity, actually. We find it in Allah, for example. We find it in many, many things. In my own life, um, I see this. When you resign to the will of God, you actually gain. So it's an interesting concept. Uh, and how do we get to resignation? Well, we said unreserved acceptance of the holy texts, what they have written. Baha'u'llah, the Bab, Abdul Baha, unreserved, the guardian writes. Um, the guardian says that we must be in close association with the Spirit and the form of Baha'i administration. That's a good test for resignation. You see, Baha'i administration has its challenges. But Shoghi Effendi says a good Baha'i is in close association with the spirit and form of Baha'i administration. Wow. So this will... You know, alone we won't get there. We have to go through this process. And of course, prayer and fasting and the spiritual laws, pilgrimage, you know, these things you will see. Um, and also stories, biographies. I was, when I was younger, I read many Baha'i biographies and I saw how the spirit of resignation generates gain and not loss in the life of people. And Peta, Tabakol. These are things that we only learn as we go along. We're not born with it yet. Thank you for um, answering the question, Shahbaz. And really, on behalf of um, the, the team and the group that's organizing these firesides. Uh, I want to thank you for taking the time to join us this evening. Um, and it's so, so wonderful to see all the lovely faces, like you said, Shafas, the unmasked faces. Uh, lovely to see you all. Um, we are going to close this evening, just a reminder that uh, the next fireside uh, from this group is taking place on June 28. Uh, but as you know, these firesides are held in different languages. The next fireside is being held in French and it will be uh, on June the 28th. So thank you again, Nason. Thank you so much for allowing me to do this. I hope you invite me back. 
Shahbazi, it was wonderful uh, to listen to you and thank you for all your insights. <laughs>